Join the conversation. You're with Cape Talk. You are with Cape Talk and with me, Sarah Jane Makwala King, standing in for Clarence Ford uh, this Friday morning. Good to have you with us. Without further ado, uh, it is time for the Naked Scientist. Uh, we cross to Dr. Chris Smith at the University of Cambridge. Let's dive straight into the questions. Vernon had uh, messaged in uh, almost as soon as we opened uh, the lines this morning to ask this question. Helium is lighter than air gas molecule. Helium is lighter than an air gas molecule. Will there be a time when Earth will run out of helium if it rises above our Earth's atmosphere and goes into outer space? What is the answer to Vernon's question? Will there be a time when we, uh, on Earth when we run out of helium? We will never run out completely of helium because it's being made by radioactive decay. In other words, when something radioactive decays or falls apart inside the Earth, there are various radioactive elements that are doing this all the time. One of the products is helium. So we generally get our helium from underground. It's trapped in various places that trap gases because of the geology and we can siphon off the helium when we collect things like natural gas or methane from underground. That does mean though there's a finite supply because it's only being made at a certain rate and it's being lost from the planet all the time for the reasons that Vernon outlines which is it's element number two in the periodic table is extremely light, so much so that it cannot be held onto by Earth's gravity. So when it makes its way up into the high atmosphere, it is eventually lost forever into space. We never get it back. Hydrogen is going too, but hydrogen's the most abundant stuff in the universe, and the planet's got loads of it, so we can always get more hydrogen. Helium, different matter. So we do have helium. It is being made slowly all the time, but we're using it far faster than it's being made and we're losing it too. So yes, helium is becoming more and more expensive because price is always a reflection on availability and supply, isn't it? So its price is going up all the time because it's harder and harder to get and we will run out eventually because our rate of consumption will be so high it won't be being replaced at the rate that we can get it at. So yes, it is effectively a finite resource. A second question was in from Logan in Edenvale, which is around dwarf planets like Pluto and Eris um, being knocked out of orbit or the possibility that they might get knocked out of orbit and find their way then into our solar system. What's the likelihood of that, Dr. Chris? There's a couple of things to consider here, which are that where do planets come from in the first place? Well, there's two sources for planets. One is that they are made in their own solar system when the solar system forms. So in other words, the ball of gas and dust that forms the star at the centre of the system has a disk of material around it, which is gas and dust, and that slowly coalesces to form planets. So some planets are born in situ, but other planets are caught. There are some rogue planets that can be flung out of systems by various gravitational manoeuvres, and they can move through space and then be grabbed by other systems as they go past because they get caught in the gravity well. There's also a lot of material out in the outer reaches of the solar system which over time, because of gravitational resonances and things like comets and giant planets jockeying for position as solar systems or systems like ours form, can, can be pulled in or tugged in by gravity and they start off outside somewhere and they can migrate in. So there's a whole raft of, of things that can happen to these planets and the reverse is also true, that some of them can form and then be flung out again because the same gravitational resonances, big planets and so on, that come into alignments infrequently can cause forces to be applied which ultimately lead to these things destabilising in their orbits and being lost. So it can happen, it does happen, but Pluto, no, we think that probably formed in situ and other planets out there... Well, we'll just have to keep an eye and, uh, dare I say, watch this space. Very good. It is actually National Joke Day today, Dr Chris, so I'm, I'm going to let you have that one because it was pretty good. Um, Nelly is asking, uh, what makes ovulation painful? What causes the pain and why does it cause pain? That is a very good question. Yeah, I think there's probably half the audience to this programme can identify with this. What are we referring to? We're referring to the process by which you release an egg from an ovary to be captured by the fallopian tube, which is connected to the top of the uterus. The egg then floats down the fallopian tube. Whether or not it's fertilised on the way, that's up to what you've been up to in the meantime. And if it is fertilised, it can then settle into the uterus as an embryo and start a pregnancy. The eggs are in your ovaries throughout your life. In fact, when a woman's pregnant, the baby inside her, if it's a girl, already has that woman who's pregnant's grandchildren in there effectively because 
from several weeks into the process of development, you put all of your future eggs inside the ovary and you're born with your full complement of eggs that you're going to have for your reproductive life if you're a woman. And every month, in response to hormones that come from the brain's pituitary gland, a clutch of those sort of immature eggs are recruited in the ovary, 40 to 100 of them, and they begin to mature or grow under the influence of these hormones. And for reasons we don't completely understand, one of them outgrows all the others, the others tend to disappear, and this one, sometimes two, mature eggs form a a big bleb on the surface of the ovary which at the right moment around day 14 in a 28 day cycle again in response to hormonal changes coming from the brain that egg is popped out from this mature follicle in the ovary and it literally goes pop and the egg comes out and as it does so it causes bleeding and a bit of inflammation and that sets in trail the or in train the next stage which is the development of a structure called the corpus luteum that produces progesterone because mostly the ovary until that point has been producing a lot of estrogen to drive the development of the uterus ready to receive a pregnancy the next stage is it produces lots of progesterone which increases the blood flow to the uterus and makes it even more receptive and capable of sustaining a pregnancy and it's that ovulation event as the egg pops out and you get that bit of bleeding and inflammation in the surface of the ovary that is the pain that some women say they can tell when they ovulate because they do feel a sort of oh that maybe catch my breath on one particular side because you tend to alternate which which ovary ovulates each month and so you think oh yep that felt like it might be happening it's day 14 or thereabouts feels like it and that's what's going on that's really I still maintain although it's been poo-pooed by various people I still maintain that I felt the moment is this too much to share on a Friday morning no I still maintain that I felt the moment uh, the implantation moment I maintain that that was a thing that I felt that moment of implantation with my son particularly and I remember messaging some friends of mine and saying I think I might now be and took a pregnancy test and here he is at 18 months old so there you are I think probably it's unlikely you felt the implantation because we're talking about something which is absolutely tiny. I mean, an embryo, which has fertilisation happens in the top third of the oviduct or the fallopian tube, and then it takes a couple of weeks for the embryo to wander its way down and get into the uterus, but it's still very tiny. It's It's got to a stage where it's literally numbers of cells you can count at that time. It hasn't got huge yet. And the uterus lining where it's going to settle that doesn't have any nerve supply. So you're not going to feel when something engages with that. But what you definitely will sense is a hormonal shift because not only is the corpus luteum I mentioned producing progesterone, but then the coating around the embryo, the outer cell mass, the so-called trophoblast, is also secreting hormones, including what is going to be the hormone that tells you in your pregnancy test, I am pregnant. So there is going to be a shift in the hormones that you produce and they are detected all around the body, including in the brain. So you will feel different and your other tissues begin to respond. Immediately you get breast tenderness and things like that. And and that's often one of the first giveaways. So it might be that your brain was putting together all these different signs and symptoms and saying, ah, I feel different. Maybe I'm pregnant. Okay, I'm going to take that. That that, that seems more likely. Um, Flower Girl has sent a message asking the following. Oh, this is a good one. Hi, Dr. Chris. What happens when I squeeze a pimple? Is it advisable to squeeze it out? Some people say that uh, there's nothing more satisfying than popping a zit. And the comedian Jasper Carrot said the definition of a good spot is one that will hit the mirror at five yards. But everyone identifies with the satisfaction of popping a spot. And is this a good idea? It depends. A spot is where a hair follicle or a sweat gland has got infected because secretions that come out of these glands in the skin, because our skin is covered in secretory glands that produce, um, we have sebaceous sweat uh, sweat glands and we have apocrine glands that produce uh, smelly stuff under your armpits in your naughty bits areas. But the Normal hair follicles and glands just produce oily substances that are there to nourish the surface of the skin and the hairs that come out. If they get clogged, then microorganisms can creep down into the duct and they feast on the material that's in there. And in the process of feasting on the material that's in there, they produce an inflammatory response 
this winds up the immune system and cells called neutrophils come in and those cells job is to eat the bad guys and one of the ways they do that is that they engulf it they sort of put out these what are called pseudopodia force arms the cell engulfs the bad bacteria pulls them inside and ingests them also the cells can effectively spew their guts up they get activated and then they throw out material which is um, highly toxic to the cells around and this causes more inflammation. So when you get pus, that's actually loads of dead white blood cells that have basically tried to kill bacteria and done it by detonating themselves in the process. This builds up into an inflammatory mass which is the swelling in the spot and because of the inflammation you get all the signs of inflammation, redness, it's hot because there's more blood flowing and it's also red because there's more blood flowing and it's painful because the inflammatory substances that are winding up the immune system also wind up the nervous system so that's why you get a red hot tender spot full of this yellow gunge and if you pop it you're putting up the pressure locally and pushing the yellow stuff out freeing up the or unblocking the duct and allowing all the inflammatory debris out can be bad though if you get it wrong because if you don't end up with the stuff being expressed and coming out it can go sideways into the tissue and cause even more inflammation and actually spread the infection further. So squeeze your spots carefully and also don't squeeze the ones on either side of your nose below your eye because that's the danger area of the face. And if you actually get infection deep in the tissues there, that shares a blood supply with uh, one of the sinuses in your brain and you can get uh, an infection going backwards inside your skull and that can be life-threatening. So be very careful about picking spots adjacent to your nose and be very careful about picking spots at all because uh, you can end up with unsightly scarring. It's better to go and see if you have bad spots and bad acne Go and see a dermatologist because there are really good creams and treatments and even antibiotics that will very quickly get control of the situation and stop this happening. There is an individual in my life who shall remain nameless who I hope is listening into this conversation and hearing the words of Dr. Chris. Stop popping your pimples, please, and thank you. Uh, we're going back into space for the next question. Keith is messaging to ask really about the fate of the two NASA astronauts, Butch Wilmore and Cinny Williams, um, who left Earth on the 5th of June, uh, aiming for an eight day flight on the Starliner spacecraft. But due now to various issues that have uh, befallen them, it looks like they're only going to be able to be brought back um, in February. Now, it doesn't sound good. And Keith is asking, why? Why do they need to wait so long to return? There's a number of reasons. The craft that took them there had a, a technical fault. I think it had some problems with leaks and of, of propellant and that kind of thing. And so it's had some technical issues. So they couldn't just jump in there and come back. This means that now they have to be part of the normal cycle of resupply and recovery from the space station because the space station is permanently manned and they have crews that go up and replace the crews that are there and the uh, vehicle that brings the new crew takes the, the existing crew and rubbish, experiments and so on back with it. So in order to make this work, what they've got to do, because they can't use the current system that's currently still docked actually onto one of the docking pods on the space station they've got to detach that and make sure that can be safely got out of the way they're going to have to bring uh, some relief crew up with some spaces and then put their two people in there on the way back down again and recover the two guys that are up there at that time but that means they've, they can't they can't just magic up a new space mission they've got to do it in the general cycle of things and this means changing the way that they're also doing the crew changeover so it's not straightforward and they're saying yes they may end up up there and beyond christmas time which um is a much longer mission than they had anticipated the other point that they're making is that because there are more people than should normally be on the space station although they're getting loads of work done because you've got extra pairs of hands to do experiments and so on they're using resources much more quickly so they're having to take more stuff back to resupply the space station which is going to take up even more space so not straightforward when things cause a spanner in the works like this We've got time for one last question, and I, this is a corker. Somebody is asking, they haven't given their name, is it possible that ancient civilizations like those that existed in Egypt had great inventions which were lost in time, resulting in them being invented all over again centuries later? Great question. I think the answer is that there were things that people knew how to do 
and which probably we had to reinvent the wheel multiple times. Because remember, the world wasn't in communication like we are today, where a great discovery in one nation can easily be shared worldwide within seconds. People had to pass things on, not with writing, because often they couldn't write and they couldn't read. They had to pass things on by word of mouth and showing. And this meant that if your community lost touch with a particular way of doing something, then it was potentially gone for good. And that meant another community or someone else somewhere else had also got to reinvent that thing. There are almost certainly metallurgy techniques that ancient blacksmiths knew how to do, which those have been lost. And there, there are almost certainly recipes for things like that, ways of doing things which people worked out how to do, but were lost when that civilization petered out or that practice petered out, almost certainly. I don't think there were space rockets, cars and computers knocking around thousands of years ago, but there were certainly techniques, practices and appreciations of nature, perhaps medicines and so on, those sorts of practices which were very, very successful at the time for certain groups, almost certainly will have been lost in the annals of time because those populations did not pass on that information because they had limited capacity to do so or document it. We have got time, I'm being told, for one very, very quick voice note. Uh, good morning. This is a question for Dr. Chris Smith. So we've, we've now got a problem with rabies in our seal population. And I just wanted to know, um, normally you get the, it gets transmitted by bites. So what would happen if a great white who feeds on, the, on these seals bites a seal? Um, you know, will that great white then get rabies? Yeah, if you could please... Give us some sort of insight. Thanks very much. 40 seconds. Rabies is a virus, and viruses are extremely fussy about what organisms they will infect. Some viruses only infect certain species because they're docking with certain chemicals which are present on cell surfaces to get the virus into the cell. And some species do not have the right so-called receptors for them to become infected. Now, rabies affects mammals like us. Seals are mammals. Sharks are fish. They have very different biochemistry. Therefore, it's unlikely that their cells will have the right markers for the rabies virus to get in. I don't know that for sure, but I'm speculating because of the differences between fish and, and mammals that that's going to be the case. So I suspect that great whites are probably not going to have a problem with mammalian rabies viruses. So I think they're probably OK. But if you were to eat the seal, that would be a different matter. I won't. But thank you, uh, Dr. Chris. Great having you with us this morning. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, Dr. Chris Smith is the Naked Scientist next Friday. Streaming countrywide on Prime Media Plus. On DSTV Channel 885. And across the city. And across the city. On 567 AM.